זה... זה... My Wargaming journey started probably like a lot of people of my generation with ethics kits and the model toy soldiers. Um, I always remember when, as a kid, there was a just around the corner from where we lived, there was a row of shops, and one of them was a hardware shop. Um, so you saw things that you'd now buy in some places like B&Q. But in there he had two big buckets. One was 132 scale toy soldiers, and the other one was 172 scale. Now, the 132 were about, I don't know, two pence a soldier, and the 172 worked, I think they were two for a penny. So show my age here now, with the being that, that cheap. But yeah, so me and my brother would go around, so every sort of weekend with pocket money and grab a hand for soldiers, I'd get the 132 scale and my brother would get 172 scale. And, and we would also get model kits, you know, birthdays and stuff like that, and we'd build model kits. And we'd play um, battles on the carpet, what we'd now call as floor wars. Uh, and back then, you all could, uh, there was a toy company called Britons. Uh, my brother was very big into the sort of agriculture farming toys, and I, and I still collected the military. But what I had was um, two cannons, 25 pounders, and they, they had this like trigger mechanism, the pullback trigger mechanism. If you put a matchstick in there, you could pull back, pull it back and fire matchsticks. So that's pretty much what we used to do. We used to line our troops up on, on the floors, on the vehicles and stuff. Um, movement was done, I think, with a toy car. and it, Walking movement was one length of the toy car and charging was two, two lengths. And we'd fire matchsticks at the troops and stuff. And anyone that was hit by a matchstick, they were taken out. And then I think if you had a, trying to blow up a tank, you had to hit it two or three times before you could blow it up. And then... We had this novel way of doing aerial bombardment where we'd hold the plane with a, and a marble, close your eyes, and count normally like to three, four, or five and let go of the marble. Um, and wherever it landed or it, la or it hit, it, it took out those things. So they was, you'd use that to try and get take tanks because you could take a tank out with one hit, we used to say. But... But when the marble bounced off, if it hit anything else, it killed those as well. So if your own troops were nearby, you ran the risk of actually killing your own figures. But, you know, it was a quick way of taking out a tank. And that was probably our first um, sort of what you would call a war game, close to the war, a war game. Um, and then when we was about, I was about, 11, 12, we, we moved. And where we moved to, um, we made friends with this lad called Lee. And he was already into Warhammer and Dungeons and Dragons. And this would have been first edition Warhammer uh, white box. Um, and it would have been the BECMI um, version of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you know, red box, blue box. Um, and that's where my wargaming really kicked off. So yeah, so we, we moved um, in, uh, uh, when I was about 11, 12, when I met this young lad called Lee and he introduced me to war, proper wargaming. The rules, books, dice and all the rest of it. And those first first few games we were playing were Warhammer first edition. Then it quickly, not long after I moved, second edition came out. But we also gravitated towards games such as Blood Bowl, which I've still got copies of. And Blood Bowl, we went mad for Blood Bowl. Um, there was nearby where we lived. There was five of us, and we played Blood Bowl a lot between the five of us. We had little league, um, leagues and championships and stuff like that. We even created our own championships, um, as you know. And, and then we started to play other games as we got slightly older. We started playing a lot of our more RPG, Paranoia, Judge Dread. Um, we also had our first foray in foray in, into historical, 
which was there was an RPG came out called Bushido, and it was set during the samurai period of Japan. We played that to death. We absolutely loved it. We all got miniatures of you know samurai miniatures and everything, painted them up, uh, and played Bushido a lot. Um, other types of war games we were play started to play we, we, we were massively big into car wars um, that was another game that we really sort of jumped on and got really uh, heavily in, involved into playing and then when things like Dark Future came out from Games Workshop we, we, we moved on to that as well um, but all in the background uh, the main sort of war game we played was Fantasy Fantasy Battles. By then, third edition Warhammer would come out, and that was, I would say, that was probably my, one of my favourite editions of Warhammer. Was third edition. But we we were playing a lot of board games, like Cosmic Encounters, um, and Kingmaker. We were playing all of those types of games, and we were playing some Avalon Hill stuff, as well. Um, I think we had our first foray into um, Advanced Squad Leader, uh, World War Two, and that was that was probably the first historical war game we played. Was uh, we didn't it wasn't miniature based, you know, it's car counter based, but that was our first sort of dip into historical. At the time, we were still predominantly playing sort of fantasy, sci-fi, sort of near future type games. And then I, I, we left school and I joined the military. And then that was slightly different type of gaming whilst I was in the military. So I served in the military. And while I was in the military, I it didn't do as much tabletop gaming as I had been doing prior to joining. Um, I, saw, I dipped into um, console gaming and stuff like that. And then I, I did... Um, I went, I ended up, towards the end of my service, I ended up working in the garrison officer's mess. And there were some, I was basically running the bar one night and there was a couple of officers in there doing the paleonics in 172 scale. And um, I kind of got involved. I, um, they kind of introduced me to sort of historics. I don't even remember what the rule set was now they were using. It was a quite an um, old set. Um, and I painted a lot of miniatures for them, um, and, and that was pretty much the only real war gaming I was doing at the time in the military. It just wasn't really that accessible where where we were, where we were located. And then when I came out of the military, my tabletop gaming blew up again. I, I started doing it a lot more. Um, one of the first games I purchased was cry havoc by standard games um, and this was um, like a traditional sort of um, counter based war game but instead of being units it was individuals so it's like skirmish and you had all of so you had these um, counters with a picture of the um, soldier on there you know the warrior knight and then all the stats and um, we got the first uh, edition of uh, that, the Quite Havoc, got really well into that. We were obs me and my brother became obsessed with it, and then we bought expansions for it. Um, and, and there were quite a few expansions. And there was, I, I believe, there, were, there was a fantasy um, expansion, but we never got the fantasy. It was mainly historical, um, and we were obsessed with that. Um, and other games I picked up around that time was Talisman, Talisman Third Edition. Um, if I remember rightly, it was when Games Workshop got rid of a load of specialist games and they ended up in places like um, The Works for like £10, something like that, ridiculously cheap. And, and um, I picked up Talisman 3rd Edition. I think I remember rightly, I picked up. Um, oh, what else did I pick up now? I picked up. I think I picked up a copy of Blood Bowl, um, and it had the the pitch was the uh, sort of like foam. I can't remember the material now. What you call it? Sort of polystyrene board. Um, 
uh, and then there were a couple of ones that were out I picked up back I mean remember which were the ones who were now um yeah so anyway I picked up those and they'll be playing or playing a lot of that and um I used to paint the miniatures all up for, for all of those uh, and that was those were predominantly the games I was playing after I came out of the military and whilst I was in university at art college it was most of it was stand, was cry havoc I actually before obsessed with that game great game and I believe it's been going to be republished um, and if it if it does I think you can you can still get copies of it if you and if it gets pre, it gets republished and um, goes back out for sale if you see it get it it's a great game you will you will become obsessed with it it's a fantastic um game anyway so I was doing that's what I was doing during um uni and I came out of the military then I went abroad for a bit working abroad um and I I was out in Southeast Asia and there, back then there wasn't really much of a gaming scene tabletop gaming scene it was all computer games um and so I went for the few years I was out there I was playing computer games and then when I came back that's when I got back into the hobby again and went mad. Yeah, so I basically returned to the UK. I ended up in Derby. Um, and I started collecting Empire. Um, I got into Fan Warhammer Fantasy again. And I thought, because that was the game I'd always enjoyed playing. A war game. Um, with miniatures as it, when I was growing up. So I got back into Warhammer Fantasy. Um, and I walked into the Derby store, basically to get some paint. Um, and that was the first time I'd been into the store. Um, and at the time, it was run by Peachy and Duncan. Um, and uh, Duncan managed to convince me to get in a Goblin War Chariot. Not quite sure how, because I wasn't even collecting Goblins and, and Orcs at the time. Uh, I was collecting Empire. Um, but that was also where I started I got my first taste of 40k um, I gone in there on a, a separate occasion and Peachy convinced me to have a go a demo do a demo of 40k um, and I basically blamed Peachy for the fact that I got into 40k and ended up buying a huge massive army um, so I started uh, collecting Space Marines Blood Angels um, and I was building up armies for both Empire and Blood Angels and then I got into Mordheim um, and I became obsessed with Mordheim and I still play Mordheim and I'm still a big fan of Mordheim. I think that's one of the best games go games I've sure ever produced. And bought a load of terrain, built loads of different war bands. I think I experimented with, with hit witch hunters normal normal game yeah, sort of the Marienbergs and all the rest of those Reichlanders and stuff. Um I think I did Orcs at one point, Undead, um Skaven. Uh, and it's the one of the games I still have. I still have all the buildings and the and the rules and I'm still obsessed with it. And uh, the fact that I'm starting a new project um where I'm taking doing it down on ten mil scale. So that I've got a travel version of more time. Um, so yeah, I went into a whole period where I was living in Derby and I was obsessed with Games Workshop. Historicals weren't on the um, radar at that point for me. I, um, I think I started to dip my toe into historicals towards the end of my time when I was living in Derby. Um, I. If I remember rightly, I think Ancient Battles had come out. Um, the first edition, and I had picked up a copy. And uh, and I, I was looking at historical stuff then, started to look at historical stuff. And then I, I ended up in Wales for a bit, um, before coming back up north to Sheffield. And that's where 
um, the historical stuff and skirmish. Okay, I really got into historical and skirmish. So he was well into Warhammer hist historical um, with um, Imperial Romans. Still playing Mordheim. Um, started playing 28, 28 mil Inquisitor in, in the um, Sheffield store um, with um, Alex and Fabian in there. Another great, another great store. Um, I've, there have been three stores that I, I've, I've really, really liked. Um, I think they've been great stores. And that was Derby Store run by Diane Peachy and Duncan. The Swansea Store at the time that was run, when it was run by Rob. Um, and then Sheffield Store when it was run by uh, Alex and Fabian. And there's some, um, in all three stores there was a great atmosphere. Uh, and I really enjoyed gaming in on all those stores uh, and painting and stuff. Um, so yeah, so um, in Chevrolet I started to get into historicals a lot more. Um, started painting uh, my first ECW miniatures. Um, and I was playing playing ECW Warhammer Historical, a version of the English Civil War rules. Um, I started getting heavily into buying war game, uh, buying foundry miniatures, uh, metal miniatures. And at the time, they used to be based pretty close to the city centre. You could go in on a weekend um, into their store and buy, buy stuff. Um, so trips into Nottingham used to be Warhammer World and Foundry. Um, now it will be Warhammer World and Warlord and North Star. Um, so yeah, I was getting, I got into heavily into uh, historicals and skirmish games. We were playing, I was playing things like Necromunda, um, as well as Mordheim and Inquisitor at twenty-eight mil scale. Um, I was slowly coming off forty k as a mass battle game, and I was slowly coming off Warhammer Fantasy playing as a mass battle game. Um, I, I was moving towards skirmish more um, um, and historical mass battle, and I I, I think the appeal. Was it? Um, there are now plastics coming out for historicals and Perry Miniatures were out producing um, a really nice stuff uh, at the time. Um, and there were other manufacturers coming out. Warlord were now on, you know, in in this on the scene, and they were doing like Raymond's Celts, and I, those really grab. I, I really like the Celts. Uh, and then you had. Uh, Mantic hitting the scene with their sort of stuff, uh, fantasy stuff, and and I, I, I kind of started to gravitate towards Mantic plastics because they were completely different. They were new, and I quite liked them. Um, I quite liked the elves at the time when we got and we got some of the new elves when they came out. And I ended up moving back down to Wales again, where. I was predominantly historical at that point. Bolt action was on the scene. I started bolt action armies. Um, I hadn't at that point dipped into flames of war. It was pretty much 28 mil um, World War II. Um, I had a copy of the Warhammer historical um, World War II rule set and then I got bolt action. Um, I was also involved with Very British Civil War. I started that in Sheffield. Um, and I'd done some background writing for them for for Cornwall. Uh, and then um, in the Empire book, uh, Singapore. Um, so I'd written some stuff for that and I got involved in that. Because I really liked that whole concept. Uh, uh, sorry, alternative war um, history. Uh, and a civil war breaking out in the UK and the different factions. And you had that thing where you could pretty much make up anything you wanted um, because it wasn't, it, was, they didn't, it didn't, you know, it didn't exist. It wasn't real. So you had a sort of a real opportunity to sort of go mad with historic. Um, so, yeah, so I was playing a uh, very British Civil War. 
And that was mainly on a skirmish kind of level, rather than like big battles or anything like that. Uh, and I, I really enjoy that, and I still like really enjoy that background, like that, that whole concept. I really like. Um, and then moved back up to Sheffield. I have moved around a lot. Um, and my skirmish game took off. You know, things like started coming out like that Gangs of Rain. Um, great little game. Uh, and I've more recently. I started to look at a lot more smaller scale. Uh, my first foray into smaller scales of, was Flames of War, um, and I actually really like that. And I, I, my my biggest reason f why I hadn't really jumped into small scales before was I was I was actually I always thought oh, it's too small. I'm not going to be able to paint it. It's really difficult to paint. Then I got a box set, star set, and. Um, I, and they actually painted up really easily. Uh, of course, if, and I'm not talking the, the tanks, vehicles, I'm talking about the actual infantry. That's what was, I always thought painting that scale of infantry would be really difficult. Um, but I was surprisingly easy how easy it was to paint. Uh, and that, that took me out of my comfort zone of painting 28 mil. Um, and then uh, I just, I, well, now I'm looking at fantasy armies, um, looking at doing historicals in 15 mil, um, planning to do the, go jump into ECW using the Pike and Shock e e Epic from Warlord, and I might actually jump in the Paleonics at some point in that same scale. Um, it's surprising that now companies can produce at that scale exceptionally well cast and sculpt, sculpted and cast miniatures um, and, and I, I mean, I've mean, gone down to 10 mil I think that's the smallest I'll go down to is 10 mil um, I've been painting up some bits and pieces from Spellcrow um, and really nice set of miniatures it's all uh, all in resin but it, the, the uh, detail on them is, is really high for such a small figure so now, yeah, so I've gone back towards mass battle, but in smaller scale. Um, and one of the major reasons for that is because storage issues. Um, I converted the garage into a hob hobby office room, but I'm under orders that nothing <laughs> strays out of there <laughs> into any other part of the house. So, I hope, so I'm restricted that if I'm going to have... Game, war games and armies they can all they've all got to fit in there so that's another reason for dropping down to scales i can store more of it um in storage work and the terrain to go with it so that's been my hobby journey it's been been quite quite wild i haven't stuck to one specific game or scale or genre and what you might call a bit of a hobby butterfly and um, i sort of flip from one to another. I look around, I see something, oh, that interests me. Uh, one of my biggest things is I watch a TV show or a film that's set in a history period and I come away thinking, oh, now, now I fancy doing that in wargaming. Um, I quite want to do that now. Um, and so I've, I've watched films and film and dramas, especially during the pandemic period. And, and I've, that's, got me on to doing war in states um, and the rise of the um, first emperor of China samurai is another one so I've gone into test of honor um, another plan is to do um, sort of Celtic tribes no, not Celts versus Romans but Celts versus Celts so running the campaign set in Celtic Britain before the Romans um, trundled over here and threw their weight about. Um, and I also, another one I, I'm quite fancy doing is the anarchy, um, the civil war between Empress Miriam Matilda and, St and Stephen de Blois. Uh, that kind of, that interests me a lot because it's slightly different. You don't hear many people covering it. Um, and it's sort of set close to the, Baron's War sort of period, so a lot of those miniatures, uh, so 
yeah, it's close to Barons Wall, but it's before Barons Wall, if I'm right, remember rightly in my history. Um, so, um, sort of Normans and very early sort of Barons Wall period miniatures could be I could get away with using. So that kind of interests me, and I'm wanting to do something around that. But that will be done in probably 28 mil scale, um, whereas the others will be done smaller scales. Um, War Age states I'm probably going to do in 20 mil using the Caesar Miniatures plastics, 172 scale. Uh, Celts will be done probably 28 mil and 15 mil. Um, plastic soldier now have the Zeist and stuff, so uh, Zeist and miniatures are quite nice. I've always liked the Celts and I fancy doing chariot wars, so 28 mil is probably a bit too big to be doing mass chariot battles, so I'll probably go down to 15 so I can put up quite a few chariots on the table to have a chariot brand war. So yeah, that's basically it really. Um, yeah, so over, during the pandemic, I started to get an interest in smaller scales. And a lot of that was driven by two factors, cost and storage. And storage being the prime factor on why I was looking at smaller scales. Um, I, I become to a point where um, it was very difficult finding the space for 28 millimeter scale armies and I always come into the thing of looking at mass battles um, I was wanting to do um, big scale battles and I was like if I want to do that then I've got to drop scales I've got to come down to 15 mil 10 mil because I just don't have a storage space um, and I do have stuff in 28 mil scale in historical, um, I have Saga stuff, and I I got the SPQR starter set. I I got um, Gangs of Rain, but though that's skirmish, but it's historical. So the, there are some 28 mil scale stuff in historical that I still play, and I play play my predominantly all the sci-fi and fantasy skirmish in 28 mil. But what I'm now looking at is a fantasy mass mass battles and I'm doing it in 15 mil and 10 mil. I already play Flames of War in 15 mil and I play Team Yankee in 15 mil. Uh, and so I'm looking at those scales at if uh, when Warhammer comes back uh, fantasy battles I probably won't do it in 28 mil I probably do it in 15 mil. Um because I can have more than one army um, in the same storage sort of space that a 28 mil army would take up. So for me, I, I've become more interested in smaller scales. Um, I'm stuck to doing some 20, 20 millimeter stuff for Vietnam. I, I just think it's a it, it's an easier scale to work with in in regards to storage and cost. Uh, and the sculpts that are coming out in those scales now from various different companies are pretty top notch. I mean, the spell stroke, spell crow stuff that we reviewed recently, which is ten mil uh, uh, in resin, it's as good as twenty eight mil scale. I mean, you're talking, you know, tiny little figures, but the amount of detail on them and the quality of the sculpt and cast is excellent. Um, and I've likewise with the 15 mil stuff from Cobblestone. I've got you can't fault it, and the 20 mil stuff from SHQ. They're in they're really good sculpts and casts. So for me, I, I, I've kind of shifted from 28 mil now down to smaller scales. Um, other stuff I still do. I mean, as you can see from behind me, there's a ton of um, board games, D and D. I've got other D&D, I've got the One Ring and stuff like that, RPG stuff, so I still do. Um, but yeah, so that my, my whole journey started, probably like most people, with Airfix, and I've gradually sort of moved on as I've got older, and I've gone through stages of where I was playing predominantly Games Workshop stuff, and then other stages where I've only played Skirmish, and I'm now um, 
looking at small smaller scales for bigger battles. Um, I probably won't go to six mil. My eyesight's shot. Um, I, I've now long and short sighted without my geese glasses. So I probably won't go any further down than ten mil. But yeah, that's that's been my wargaming journey. Well, gaming tabletop gaming journey. Um, I've been quite advanced. I've had quite the advantage of where I grew up in the eighties. And I've seen them big changes over the those years between then and now uh, within tabletop gaming, uh, and how much it's more starting to go more mainstream. I mean, Dungeons and Dragons is pretty much mainstream these days, um, especially after um, pop culture influences like Stranger Things, and and we've seen a over the course of the pandemic board games became more mainstream so for me you know it's, it's quite a, my, my journey has been during that period and it's been quite a fascinating one to watch as a gamer that how that end, industry's changed and, and it's progressed I mean the scopes of miniatures how they've progressed technology wise and we now get to the point where you can buy a 3D printer and print your own um, so yeah it's been a quite a big big good journey but from the 80s when I was first introduced to the whole the actual hobby of tabletop gaming by a friend called Lee to where I am now um, that's it that's basically my journey um, don't forget like and subscribe